Hello everyone, this is Stefan Lessmann and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our introductory video on the Bachelor Lecture Introduction to Programming, which my colleague Alona Jarova and I will offer in the coming summer semester. In this video, I would like to share some information with you concerning the organization of the course, concerning logistics and essentially what Alona and I uh, have in mind. So um, let's have a look. First of all, um, appreciate your interest in learning how to code, how to program. Uh, let me briefly comment on the learning objective. Things we will together try and achieve in this module. Um, generally, we do not expect any prior experience in programming. So if you are entirely new to the field, no worries, this course is designed for you. But after taking the course, um, you will be able to translate well-defined task problem descriptions into some runnable Java code that will basically solve your problem. And um, in the course of doing so, you will acquire skills that allow you to implement simple and somewhat more advanced algorithm in running code using standard programming constructs, including conditions, loops, and other programming elements such as data structures and control statements. That's pretty much the foundation of any language. Java is uh, called an object-oriented language. So the last overarching objective is to familiarize you with the concept of object-oriented programming so that you will be able to apply OOP to small-scale type of problems. That is, in a nutshell, what the course is about, our overall goals. Now, in order to achieve these goals, um, let's pause for a minute. One thought or a thought on learning computer programming. Well, what I want to highlight here is you just have to do it. Obviously, Alona and I are here to help and we will guide you through your journey into Java programming. But when it comes to programming languages, no matter which one interests you, there is no way to actually learn how to use this unless doing that. So with this in mind, we will provide a set of puzzles, tasks, exercises, and well, we will also provide solution to these tasks and exercises and puzzles, but it's, it's really important, it's essential, I'd say, that you sit down at home and try to solve these exercises on your own. And then we can get together and discuss your solution, see what was easy for you, see what was difficult. But um, just as a little cautionary warning, if your idea should be to follow a lecture and maybe follow a tutorial and afterwards be able to program or afterwards have achieved the objectives I just identified, I regret to say you that is not gonna work. What really, really matters is that you spend time on your own and try to apply Java or try to apply programming to the exercise tasks that you will receive in the scope of the course. Now, um, with this note, who actually is the target group of this module? Um, well, to be really honest, we, we do not have any specific personas in, in, in mind. It's an introductory module. It is available for every student of our faculty, School of Business and Economics, maybe also students from adjacent faculties. Depending on your specific study program, the course might be a mandatory elective module, 
that should be the case for the vast majority of students from the School of Business and Economics. Possibly you can also take the course as an elective module. In doubt, if in doubt, I recommend that you get together with the examination office in charge of your study program and clarify what options you have to get credits from this course, which, by the way, offers a total amount of six ECTS upon completion of the final examination. One bit that you might want to consider here is that should you plan to take a master course after your bachelor studies, there are a few master programs that would require you to demonstrate certain programming skills. And one example is the Master in Information Systems, with my colleagues and Art Lasov and I offer here at our faculty, we also require applicants for that master program to demonstrate some programming skills. So taking this course is also a very good opportunity for you to get the required credits and skills in programming should you need them later on for a master program, right? And as most, and if I am not misled at all, courses at our faculty, the course is designed as a mix of lectures which normally amount up to two hours per week and a tutorial session, which also amounts to two hours teaching per week. Hmm. At least that used to be the design that we have implemented a couple of years ago. But you already know that in summer 2020, everything will be a little bit different and that the entire university runs a well, digital only strategy when it comes to teaching. So um, let's have a look how this is gonna affect the Java course. We will stick to this duo of having a lecture in order to introduce programming concepts, cover some, provide some background, you know, um, and in addition, which is so important, we will have computer exercises where we basically do Java programming, where we carry out programming, where we work on clear defined tasks and trying to solve these tasks using the Java programming language. And as I said before, um, the idea would be, and this is what I really, really recommend is that you'll get an exercise and then you have a week to work on this exercise before we will basically have the tutorial corresponding to that exercise and solve the problem together. I do know from the past that there are certain students that are tempted to come to the tutorials unprepared and I admit that it is a temp temptation to just wait for the solution to arrive as opposed to just trying to solve the problem on your own. Very tempting, I know, but I can only re-emphasize you would not achieve the course objective and you would not learn how to program, which I suppose is the very reason why you consider taking this course. So don't adopt such a strategy when we give out a homework. Make sure you plan for some time, two hours, maybe a bit more, maybe even a bit less per week in order to work on the exercise task. I can't stress how, I can't stress enough how important that is. And obviously in preparing for exercises, you can also work together with your peer students where Given the circumstances, I would ask you to also make sure that you organize your collaboration via digital channels. For example, channels like those you will be exposed to in, in this course and I guess also many other courses at our faculty. Um, there is a little teaser here mentioned on the slide. Right, you probably have already seen the star. The star. Um, Alora, 
planned some very interesting extension of the course, very interesting for you. Um, there is a certain certificate, a certificate by Oracle, which is the company behind the Java programming language, that you can obtain. And we will try to make sure that our exercises already prepare you for the Oracle certification, but more on that later. Um, let me further elaborate how we cope with the situation in summer 2020. As a matter of fact, for this course, we are in a very luxurious position. And um, the, reason, the reason why that is so is that my colleague Bart Barthens has written a book on uh, Java programming, which we also use <coughs> as our main textbook in the course. And on his website to that book, he has made a video, uh, available slides, but more importantly, also video lectures to the vast majority of relevant chapters. And you'll get links to these videos very soon, and we will identify which videos in particular are relevant for our course. Um, maybe it's a good opportunity to have a quick look at Bart's website. Um, I have it open somewhere. Oh yeah, here it is. Um, let me check my recording. Um, I'm also learning how digital channels work, as you can see. Can you see this? Yeah. Yeah, you can. That works well. Okay, so you see the, the website right here. Uh, it's attached to a book, Basic Java Programming, or well, that is a lecture Bart has developed based on his book, Basic Java Programming. And uh, here you can see all the videos, right? Freely available for download, uh, all on YouTube. And that is a, an invaluable resource for us, especially in uh, this semester. And we will make use of that, right? Let me go back to my slides. We will make use of that in the lecture. Um, since these videos from Bart are available, you will be expected to watch Bart's videos and we will not record our own videos for the lecturing sessions. If you think about it, that would be a little bit of a waste and we can use our time, I believe, in a better way, emphasizing the practical part, the tutorial part. And to that end, we will pre-record all the videos for the tutorial sessions and make these available via Moodle. So you will have the video lectures from Bart to familiarize yourself with a chapter then you'll get some exercises from us. Then you will receive the video tutorial pre-recorded and done by Alona that basically shows you how the specific exercise task can be approached. That's basically the idea. And in addition to that, since I do not have a need to pre-record videos for most of the lecture sessions, I have some free time, right? And um, that is useful because I guess that by just following Bart's videos and Alona's videos that will be available on our Moodle page very soon, that is great content, but you know, some, some questions will probably pop up, right? I mean, after all the big advantage of normally having a proper lecture session where we all come together and have an opportunity to discuss and interact. That's what really makes up a university lecture. And well, unfortunately, we are denied that opportunity in the coming semester. So long story short, we will have a weekly consultation session in the form of a live video conference using Zoom. Zoom is the tool we will make use of, and it is also a nice 
and really available video conferencing tool that you could make use of in order to collaborate with peers when you form study groups, working groups to, for example, work on our exercise tasks, right? So we will have the video sessions and I plan with one session per week, just as a usual lecture, where there will be no prepared material, right? So I, I don't go to the sessions, bring my slide and talk about my slides. No, 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 no. The idea really is that we'll, we'll get together and that you have an opportunity to ask questions. And I certainly expect you to have watched Bart and Alona's video beforehand so that you are qualified to ask questions. Um, otherwise, these live meetings won't be very beneficial. But uh, knowing that programming is a non-trivial task and then knowing that many of you will start from scratch, I think it is really important that I don't spend my time on redoing what Bart has already done, but use my time in a better way to be available for you to discuss your questions and problems, if any. That's pretty much the idea for the Java lecture and how we're going to take it in the coming semester. Now, I realize that the video was not working properly. Um, sorry for that. Um, as I said, um, all a little bit new and the technology that we have available, uh, not fully developed maybe, but um, I know you have the slides and, um, and my voice, so the video is probably dispensable. Uh, nonetheless, sorry that the previous reflection upon the organization of the lecture was somewhat impacted by dysfunctional technology. Um, I hope it will be better in uh, the reminder. So I have already commented on Bard's textbook or well, the book of Bard and his um, colleagues that we use for the course. It's called Beginning Java Programming. So it's an introductory text. The object-oriented approach. So that's one thing that I like a lot about this book is that it really emphasizes object-oriented programming, which is a crucial part of the course. And we're going to spend a lot of time on teaching you the principles of OOP. You also have the link to the website here on the slide. It's www.dataminingapps.com. Um, there you find a list of books, um, including this one, Java Programming, and here is the link to the videos. And as I said, um, the overlap between Bart's lecture for which he has developed these videos and uh, the lecture we used to teach at Humboldt is very, very high. It's not 100% though. And on the one hand, we will identify on the Moodle page which videos matter for you and also when we expect you to watch them. And um, for the few sessions where just there is no video available, I will then pre-record a video. Uh, there is a session on data structures and algorithms, for example. So there I'll pre-record a video so that you will always have this, this tandem of a video lecture and a video tutorial walking you through some code to revisit the concepts of the lecture and of course exercises for you to work on, right? Um, well, given that we use an English textbook and given that Bart, who is from uh, Belgium actually, also does his teaching in English, you might still be interested in some additional resources. Maybe you prefer a German uh, textbooks or anything. Uh, I do not make any specific recommendations. I just acknowledge here that Java is a big technology and the number of, of books, blogs, tutorials, in general resources that is available online, uh, much of which is available for free, is really vast. So loads of stuff for you available 
just check out what you like the best, all right? Let me quickly go through the topics, or if you wish, the individual chapters. There is an introductory chapter, just some fundamentals of Java. Um, and then we have kind of, well, three blocks, three important blocks, I would say. Block number one is all about learning how to program. You will learn about controls, control statements, programming contracts to organize the flow of your program, which code is executed and won and under which conditions. This is what I mean by what I mean by control statements. So we really start from scratch, from zero. Okay? That's block number one. And in fact this this block is pretty much um, generic. Control statements statements to control the flow of a program. You have these in any programming language, so it's good to learn about them should you later need or want to learn yet another programming language. The second and the biggest part of the lecture then concerns object-oriented programming. I do not imagine any one of you to have heard about OOP before, right? Um, think about as an approach toward writing programs, big programs, commercial programs, complex programs. You can imagine that if you are to develop some really complicated type of program together with, with dozens or hundreds of peer developers, it can be extremely complex to keep track of all the parts of the programs and interdependency, etc., etc. It can be extremely complicated to keep the program up to date when requirements change over time, when new technologies become available. And that used to be a major problem in software development in the past. And this approach of object-oriented object programming was basically born as an attempt to address these challenges of keeping programs maintainable, and updatable, albeit computer programs growing bigger and bigger and more complex and yet more complex. It's a way to do programming, okay? And you'll learn how that works. And then um, there is a chapter on, well, data structures and algorithm, which is a little larger and will re deserve, does deserve some, some, some time, you know. So that's basically the third block. We also handle um, or talk about the handling of exceptions, how you can write your program in a robust way so that it doesn't crash if something goes wrong um, on the fly when covering or approaching the data structure part. So these three building blocks. That's pretty much the scope of the lecture in this year. Um, we used to do a little more. We used to do database programming as well learning how to interface a relational database from your Java program since summer 2020 is, well, by today, uh, one week shorter. And because it starts a little later, right, uh, we decided to abandon that chapter. So we will only have these three core blocks. But um, well, I hope that does not put you off, and it shouldn't, because um, these core blocks, introduction to Java programming, object-oriented programming, and data structures, and algorithms, that's actually quite a bit. And um, as one of the highlights of this year's course, it's, it's unique, it's a first-time thing, um, we aim at readying you for these Oracle certificates that I was already hinting at at a previous slide. So there are, well, various certificates that you could acquire, that you could get from Oracle upon completing certain exams. And um, 
two interesting certifications that Oracle offers. Um, um, the foundational one, or there is this certificate Java Foundations, which requires passing an exam. And uh, another one is Oracle Certified Professional, OCP 11, which uh, you see here on the lower right hand side of the slide. And that's a little more demanding and it requires you to complete two examinations. Now, first of all, whether you want to get any certificate with Oracle is entirely up to you and has nothing to do whatsoever with the evaluation of the Java course. How we evaluate the model, I'll comment on that on the next slide. That is something that you might want to do in addition, getting a nice certificate, pimping your CV a little bit, you know, that's basically the idea. Um, so first of all, we want to point out this opportunity. Now in more detail, um, this first certification, Java Foundations, basically confirms uh, your knowledge of the fundamentals of the Java programming language. Um, it does not, you know, require any professional experience with Java or something the like. Um, still, you have to complete this exam where you must know how to write and execute a Java program, work with the JDK, that's another acronym, we'll clarify on that in a subsequent session. You need to know a little bit about the Java runtime environment, that's the topic of uh, the next session also, and then pass this exam, Java Foundations 1T0811, whatever that stands for. And um, well, as a matter of fact, upon inspecting this examination, Alona and I, we, we felt, you know, that is pretty much what we teach you. In fact, we teach you more than what you need for that exam. So by completing the course successfully, you should be very much ready to not only take, but also pass this exam by doing so, um, earning a nice certificate, Java Foundations, and we would in fact adjust the exercises a little bit. You know, bring in some, some new task to really make sure that by following the exercises, you'll be ready to take this Java Foundations exam and get this certificate. As to the second one, the even more sophisticated um, one or the next level one, if you wish, Oracle Certified Professional OCP, um, that one would confirm your proficiency and broad knowledge of the Java programming language and good coding practices. You see uh, a little more experience needed here. And uh, also you need to pass these two exams, OCP Programmer 1 and OCP Programmer Part 2. Well, well, to be honest, in our course, we do cover the topics of the first exam. So for that one here, as you see, this one, right? Same as this one. Follow with the exercises, do the homework, and you'll be fine. Um, the scope of the second exam we do not cover. Our course does not have enough time to cover that as well. Um, but, but still, I mean, you, you have a good preparation and could easily invest some more time if you wish to get the second certificate as well but this requires you working on your own for the OCP part two. Oop, sorry for that. This is where I wanted to go. Now, how about our exam? Yes, there is also an exam. Or, well, first we do our own grading. Again, these Oracle certificates are a nice to have, I suppose, and we will adjust our tutorial session to prepare you the best we can 
and then it's up to you whether you want to go there. For completing the module and getting the credits, you will have to pass an exam. And that used to be a written exam, 90 minutes, and the, well, only examination that you have to complete to, um, to get your grade and pass the module. Now, for summer 2020, um, you have to take, well, basically all information and also this information on the assessment with a, with a grain of salt. I suppose there will be a written exam as there used to be. I suppose that by summer it will be possible to have traditional exams, physical exams. Um, that is also the plan of the university as far as I have been told. But of course there is some probability that things might change. Please bear with that. right? I can't guarantee you that we will have a written exam. Uh, I estimate we will and then you'll do find an example from an old exam already on our Moodle page. And um, I will also make available some more examples for you, also more recent exams, so that you have a good understanding of what we expect. Um, well, I should suggest you just uh, have a look on our Moodle page and look at the old exam uh, to familiarize yourself with the format. The old exam is from summer 2016, but the format, the type of question, you know, the overall flavor that has not changed and we do not plan any changes. It will stay the same and thus even the exam that's available right now gives you a good example of what we expect. And um, yeah, with that we are almost done. Um, maybe a final remark offering a programming lecture or an introductory lecture to programming. Why do we choose Java? Uh, maybe you have already used R in other courses of the faculty, or maybe you know at least that other four courses of our faculty use R. Uh, same with many master level courses where knowledge of R is mandatory. Uh, maybe you know other programming languages that are popular these days, possibly Python. Why Java? Yeah, um, well, on the one hand, there are many, many good reasons why learning Java makes a lot of sense. I like this website by developer.com uh, where they regularly update the top 10 reasons to use Java. Or, well, even they changed, they, developer.com, changed their terminology a little bit. The top 10 reasons to still be using Java um, acknowledging that there is competition by other languages that gain more and more popularity. Um, have a look at the website if you are interested. From my perspective, I made the decision for Java uh, a couple of, of semesters ago. There were some technical considerations concerning the many available frameworks and the broad applicability of Java in various types of applications. Um, that is all open source and that many wonderful open source tools are available. And in which you write your Java code, um, expect your code, debug your code and have many neat features to help you write good code. All that is available for free. But um, honestly, the most important determinant uh, for me was that Java, in my opinion, just exhibits the, the right amount of complexity. Uh, there is nothing that would not be needed. But on the other hand, it's not like many of, well, our Python I was mentioning, many of these... Um, popular programming languages that try to take away responsibility from the developer to a large degree. I want you to learn programming the proper way from, from scratch. Um, well, the type system is a key element here. Um, when you write 
code in Java and you would store some data, data that maybe a user um, enters by completing a, a text form. Now you store and process that data in Java, it's your responsibility as a programmer to make sure that you tell your program essentially what type of data you are working with. If you work with text data, you need to tell your program, I work with text data. If you work with numbers, you need to tell your program, I work with numbers. More specifically, you need to tell, well, you know, this number is actually um, a real number that I want to store with a certain precision, whereas uh, that other number actually is an integer number where there is no fractional part. And that may sound a little bit complicated at first glance, and I do admit that it uh, even sounds complicated to me, but um, we will see the coding examples and can then elaborate more on that. You will inevitably learn a little bit of what's happening under the hood when you do programming by, by doing it in Java as opposed to certain other languages. And that I believe is an extremely useful. Another reason is that Java is strictly object oriented and um, object-oriented programming is something that's very important. Um, my experience with languages like R or Python is such that many students later find it a lot easier to use these have they learned proper, proper programming sometime before in their studies. Um, I teach some master courses on deep learning, for example. I guess you have heard about that term. If you haven't, don't worry. But, but anyhow, um, in these courses, we will use some, some libraries from the big IT companies, Microsoft and Google and Amazon, etc. And um, obviously they write excellent code and they make a lot and uh, make use of object-oriented programming contracts a lot. And if you've never seen that before, um, you might have a hard time learning these powerful libraries. So um, anyways, I'm talking too much. This object-oriented programming is something extremely important to write production level code. And at the same time, even if you never find yourself in the situation to write code for production, it's very useful to learn programming the proper way. Java will provide that and this is why we picked it. All right, so um, that is it as far as the introduction goes. Thank you very much for uh, taking your time and watching these videos. I hope you will enjoy the course a lot. Alona and I look much forward to the course and I hope that you will be happy with the digital only format in which we offer the course. The Moodle page is already up and running. Uh, yet in a somewhat premature status. We've been working on it, we update it at a daily basis, so why not already signing up for the course or for the Moodle course in particular so that you can receive announcements whenever we share some. And um, also, should you have any questions or should you wish to make any comments or get in contact with Alona and myself or your peer students, please make use of the Moodle forum. Being pretty much denied an opportunity to meet and come together in person, we critically depend on digital channels and our Moodle forum will be extremely useful to all of us to interact and um, discuss. So make use of that. Okay, that was it. Thanks a lot. And I look forward to see you soon in Introduction to Java Programming. Bye-bye.